Good evening. Welcome to everyone to the third webinar of this series. Uh, I am Patrick Elias. I'm a retired Court of Appeal judge, a patron of PBI UK, and president of the Alliance for Lawyers at Risk. The Alliance has a membership of around 100 very senior and respected lawyers, both practitioners uh, and academics. Its aim is to assist lawyers and other human rights defenders at risk. Uh, it aims to assist them in various ways, sometimes by providing legal support, but more often, in fact, it ends up showing solidarity and giving moral support in various ways. The Alliance was set up over 10 years ago by Sir Henry Brooke, after he retired from the High Court bench, and I took over from him when the Alliance was relaunched some three years ago. In practice, the Alliance works very closely with PBI UK. I confess I knew nothing about PBI until I was persuaded to join the Alliance, but I've become fully persuaded of its enormous value in the area of human rights and in the protection of the vulnerable and the weak. I've met in person many of the human rights defenders who operate in various parts of the world. I will never forget the extremely inspiring uh, talks of two such defenders when they received the Henry Brook Award for their activities at an occasion in the Supreme Court just a couple of years ago. It was extremely uh, powerful. I think what came across to me above all was their enormous integrity, their very deep commitment and their modesty. They often face the most terrifying pressures. They face harassment, bullying, uh, physical attacks and even death. And furthermore, they're not just worried for their own sake, but often there are threats made to their families, which makes matters massively worse, of course. These titles are appropriately, uh, these seminars, I should say, are appropriately titled Resilience, Hope and Solidarity. But I'd add one other characteristic, which seems to me just as important, and it's courage. Uh, we in the West live in democracies, notwithstanding all their faults. And I think it can be extremely difficult to grasp quite how difficult lives, uh, the life is for many of these human rights defenders operating in authoritarian regimes. They live in a permanent shadow of fear, as I say, both for themselves and their families. You have to be resilient. You have to share your burdens. You have to have courage or you go under. And you need hope. Otherwise, it would be impossible to keep going. The fact that most of them seem to retain hope in the face of so many setbacks and so many difficulties. It seems to me to be a great testament to the human spirit. PBI offers support in many ways on the ground. I think what the Alliance principally offers is acting as a witness and letting governments and ambassadors of these authoritarian regimes know that as it were, we have our eye on some of these human rights defenders and we will be interested if anything happens to them. When a number of international bodies do the same, I think it does make a difference. It does make governments more circumspect. They know they're being monitored. They know they will face very embarrassing and difficult questions if things go wrong. It's far from a solution, of course, to the problem faced by defenders, but I believe it does have value and is more than an empty gesture. Today's webinar is different to the other two we've had on uh, so far. You will not see uh, human rights defenders on the screen as it were, giving their stories. The stories you're going to hear are part of a multimedia story telling a project entitled The Right to Defend Portraits of Resilience, Hope and Solidarity. PBI is launching this today. It will su not surprise you to know that uh, PBI UK director Susie Batcon is heavily involved in this. She traveled the world with filmmaker Manu Valcarce to record the testimonies over, of over 150 uh, HRDs across different countries. They did not have a Hollywood budget. Uh, Susie, of course, is renowned for her enormous energy. Some of you may know that about 90%, I think it is, of the universe is dark energy and it's undiscovered. And we have uh, these very complicated uh, pieces of machinery, massive hydrogen, uh, hadron colliders in Switzerland to find it. But I think they might be wiser to look in the London offices of PBI UK. I reckon most of the energy is found there. I would also like to thank Manu, both for the excellency of his work and his very great commitment. He's not on a Hollywood salary either. I gather he's looking in today 
and I know we would all want to thank him very much indeed for all his efforts uh, on behalf of PBI. Today you'll hear a verbatim account given by six HRDs from very various parts of the world. Uh, I say verbatim, in fact it's translated for most people, although you can get it in the original Spanish uh, if you wished. Um, it's a nice philosophical question as to whether translated verbatim is still verbatim, but I'm going to consider that it is. Um, we have two outstanding actors who are speaking the words on behalf of these HRDs. Juliet Stevenson is a world-class performer. Uh, I suspect she will be known by virtue all of you. I'm not going to embarrass her by re recounting her various achievements. To su suffice it to say that even just before lockdown, she was the lead in a play originally written in 1912, I gather, called Doctor. It's had rave reviews, all the ones I've seen are five stars. And she received the Critics Circle Award for Best Actress for her performance in that play. Christopher Cahoon is a seasoned actor, a television character. He is also, in fact, uh, in the play, uh, The Doctor, uh, which will be coming back to the West End ne next year, I gather. So you must get your tickets when it does. Uh, but he's played uh, a number of other things, both on television and elsewhere. He's played, I'm told, The Scar in The Lion King and also Malcolm X, but I don't think it was in the same gig, at least I hope it was. Um, I can say I listened to the rehearsal of this and uh, you will not be disappointed. Uh, I should add there's a question and answer session at the end. You might think the automatic thing to use is the Q&A on your screen, but I'm going to ask you to use chat. I can't remember why, but please can you use chat uh, when you deal with questions and answers. After the actors have done their bit, uh, Susie will say something about the multimedia project and will answer questions about the film. But also feel free to ask questions to the actors about matters relating to their art and any issues around putting themselves in the shoes of real people, as it were. With that introduction, I now pass over to Juliet Steens. These are the words of Kevin Ramirez Vasquez, environmental activist from the community of El Liston in Northern Honduras. I have received many threats. We know that for defending our territory, defending our rivers, which are the veins of our mother earth, the first thing that comes are the threats. Sometimes you feel like giving up the fight but you fall in love with the struggle. Kevin Ramirez. Since the coup d'etat in 2009, democracy in Honduras has been under attack. 12 prominent families together control over 80% of the country's wealth. What we do is inform and train communities and individuals as human rights defenders so that they know what their rights are defend them and claim them. We organize meetings with women and young people, not just to give information, but also to discuss how to defend our common goods, what to do against this oppressive system that develops projects which affect the communities where we live, to defend our communal home, defend our rivers and the blood of our mother earth. We want each family to be self-sufficient every community to feel that they are in charge of their communities, that they can confront the business people who deceive them. In 2012, local organizers became aware of a hydroelectric project which was coming to the area and taking control of four rivers. We asked them for training from lawyers and environmental experts on how hydroelectric projects worked and how we could oppose this. What we learned, we used in our work with local communities. And what we discovered was that the project was illegal. There had been no environmental impact report, no consultation. Human rights lawyer, Donald Hernandez, points out that since the 2009 coup, Honduras has declared itself open to business and encouraged foreign companies to take up mining concessions. Powerful Honduran families who supported the coup 
have also been granted concessions to rivers for hydroelectric developments for periods of 50 years. A Canadian company that has been operating in the region for 10 years has brought environmental devastation. More than 60 families have been diagnosed with metal contamination in their bodies. They don't do the consultation that they're supposed to do. Previous and informed consultation. And they don't tell the truth to the communities. Instead, they try to divide the communities by buying leaders so that they can go ahead with their projects. There has been pollution of the rivers from where they explode dynamite, explode bombs to loosen rocks and fell deeply rooted trees. The toxins from the explosion end up in the freshwater springs in the river and they pollute the river where they kill the animals, the fish, the water snails. There is also the question of privatization. There are already communities where people have to get permission to use the sand, use the stones. They privatize the lands where we grow our maize, our beans, cardamom, coffee and graze our animals. There are places where people can't access the rivers because they're privatized. The owners are the businessmen, the owners of the dam. They have militarized the area, installed police posts. These are things that have never been seen before around here. Some employees were drawn from the local communities, but now almost all of them have been laid off. They were cheated. And now employees from other regions have made local girls pregnant, some of them 18 or 15 years old. All this is why we are defending our land. We are obliged to defend our common home. In 2016, after years of threats from people linked to a company building a dam project against which she was protesting, Environmental campaigner and indigenous leader, Berta Cáceres, was murdered by armed thugs in her own home. The death of Berta Cáceres set this area on fire. Berta is not dead. Berta is in the communities. Even though Berta did not visit here, she was with us in the struggle and yes, we knew her. We felt stronger because of her. Kevin himself has received many threats over the years. I've had to leave the region three times. The first time I was gone for a month, the second time for another month, and when we returned, my wife was attacked with a machete. We made various reports of the crime, but they've gone nowhere. The threats are from local government, the mayor's office, from the businessmen, they are the associates of the mayor in the municipality who have threatened us and insulted us. They have even put a price on my head and I've been singled out many times for assassination. We know that when we defend these territories, defend the water, defend our common resources, the first thing that comes are the threats. Kevin often finds himself wondering if he has regrets about being involved in something that has made his family's life so hard. Often we can't get the money to travel from one community to another, and I often have to walk for five or eight hours. Sometimes you get tired. You are drained by the expense of it all. Sometimes you feel like emigrating to the United States when you see what is happening in our own country, where we are governed by the force of arms. We know that deaths may await us because they send soldiers when we make blockades or take to the streets. We have no employment. We have no security. But we have life. We have the river. That motivates us to keep fighting. You think of your children, your neighbours, of everything surrounded you, and that if you don't do it, who will? When you see the communities defending themselves, see the trainees, the water committees in the, com in the communities, that enriches you. When you see humble people with a smile, see that there are so many innocent children who don't know what, what may be coming to them, 
then you are filled with love and feel committed to the struggle. When I see the river, I feel excited and proud because we defend that river. We defend it from those businessmen that come to pollute it. And there are organizations like PBI. The support PBI offers us, gives us strength, encouragement, so we can keep going. These are the words of Sandra Alarcón, a human rights lawyer in Mexico. I realized a long time ago that there are groups that are particularly vulnerable and who have nobody to defend them. Women, indigenous people, migrants. If they don't have a lawyer, they don't have any rights. So that's what brought me to be a human rights defender. The state of Guerrero in Mexico has one of the highest rates of violence against women and femicide. Rates of violence against women are exceptionally high and impunity is a historic problem. Guerrero is one of the states where women are killed simply for being women. So generally, the judges in Guerrero stigmatize women who look for justice. I also think the fact that there is impunity and no investigations encourages these crimes against women to continue. There continues to be femicides in communities because there is nobody to stop them. At the end of the day, it always remains a private event between a husband and wife or between children, and it doesn't go further than that. The Human Rights Center of Montaña de Tachinolan supports anybody who has suffered human rights abuses in Guerrero, particularly from indigenous communities. Valentina Ruciendo Cantu is a MEPA indigenous woman. In 2002, she was sexually tortured by members of the Mexican army. She was 17. She went to wash clothes in the river and soldiers approached her and questioned her about guerrilla activity in the area. Then she was raped by at least eight soldiers. She tried to get medical attention and report the crime, but when she accused the army, nobody would listen to her or help her. The center could not get justice for her at local or federal level. Nothing at national level. So we went to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and then the Inter-American Court. In 2010, a verdict was issued against the Mexican state declaring that the armed forces sexually tortured Valentina Ruciendo. Mexico was declared responsible in an international arena. 16 years after the attack in June 2018, the Human Rights Center succeeded in getting a sentence for two of the aggressors. This was a historic moment because it's the first case that having gone to the inter-American system achieved a sentence at national level. Valentina today is a human rights defender. She became one through circumstances in her search for justice. She has worked for change, not just in her own case. She has worked in solidarity with other movements, and indigenous communities. She's involved in various social struggles, mainly in raising awareness about cases of sexual torture so that no one would suffer what she suffered. She has confronted all her adversity with dignity and courage and has been a model for other women. The work of a human rights defender is hard and without their example, Sandra feels she wouldn't continue. What keeps me here in Guerrero, Guerrero is the possibility of making a difference, however small, and that's why I continue as a human rights worker. Knowing cases such as Valentina's and others, we can't abandon them. We work as a team. The people we work for are my hope, my motive. Their example and the possibility of supporting them is what makes me continue here.
JLo Cordova, Honduras. JLo Cordova is a human rights activist in Honduras working with trans women. And in this role, she has taken part in many demonstrations. These are her words, spoken by Juliet. I have experienced various attacks, three assassination attempts from the military police for doing the accompaniments that I do. I'm really pleased because I have managed my temper. I had a really strong temper because of the violence I've experienced. When we were marching in 2010, we took a beating from the security forces and they told us that if we resisted, they were going to beat us up and kill us. The day I was attacked, this white car stopped and started shooting. They hit my friend in the arm and me in the back. I stayed there on the ground because I couldn't even move my legs. They were completely numb. The guy got out of the car and they were all dressed in military uniform with their faces covered by hoods. I stayed with my face completely still because I thought this guy is going to shoot me in the head. So I didn't move my eyes, I didn't blink. When he saw I wasn't blinking, he went to kill the others that were fighting back. Then he got into the car and they left. I crawled to a petrol station and I asked for help. They called an ambulance, but it didn't arrive. I called my cousin, a cousin who really loves me, who accepted me as I was. They took me to the hospital. I didn't have an operation when I arrived. They don't operate on someone who comes in after being shot. They leave them until the next day. It's like they're saying, if this person dies, who cares? It's just some homosexual, a transsexual, it's not important. But if it's a well-known person, they attend to him immediately. On the 29th of March, 2016, J-Lo Cordoba suffered an assassination attempt in the central district of Tegucigalpa. An unidentified man approached her and fired at her twice. She was shot in the hand and in the chest. There was a man in military uniform. I look at him and say, what's wrong? I turn around because I don't know, I, I felt something like a chill or something. And he took out a gun and shot me in the chest and ran away. So I fell to the floor and I get back up. But when I get back up, I don't feel anything. I said it's a rock, but it was still inside me. Then a bit of blood came out of my chest and I was fainting, I was sweating, I felt so tired. My friends hailed a taxi and took me to the hospital. The person that came to see me wasn't the doctor. He took a photo of the wound on his phone and he sent it to the doctor via WhatsApp. You can't do that. You can't save a life like that. Joining our coerist changed my life. In our careers, it's like we're psychologists. It's like we're friends. We are support. We are words of encouragement. Arco Iris, which means rainbow, is an organization that provides support to LGBTI people in Honduras. It supports victims of violence, works on awareness initiatives, promotes HIV prevention programs, and lobbies the Honduran government. In the year to March 2016, six members of Arco Iris were killed in Honduras. Many others have faced intimidation, harassment and physical attacks. Some of its staff have had to leave the country because of the threats they were receiving. I thank God that I'm calm now and I don't get worked up. If there's a problem that makes me angry, I know how to control it. Not with violence, but with silence. I walk away. I learned that there are not only bad people in the world, but also good people. And that I didn't have to be like them, the bad people, but I had to learn to be good like those who helped me. Now I am a defender. Now I am with them.
These are the words of David Ravello, a community leader in Colombia. Prison has taught me a lot. David Ravello has spent a total of 10 years in prison as a result of his trade union activities. He's had death threats too. His family were forced to flee and he had to wear a bulletproof vest all the time. Death was breathing down my neck. All those things that happened. It's not that I'm stubborn. I think it's the commitment and the conviction and seeing the sacrifices people have made. I have survived. I managed to stay alive in spite of all the things they did to me. He worked to make public a controversial video involving members of the government and various paramilitaries came after him. But as a result of support from international organizations like PBI, they decided not to kill him, but to pursue him through the courts instead. The prosecutor was ex-military. He got seven years. Because when you find yourself in prison, you're faced with a choice. Of course, you find yourself with feelings of impotence, sadness, melancholy. But I had this choice. I could either continue with the negative emotions or take the decision, even in prison, to carry on with the human rights work which I'd been doing outside. I chose to continue my human rights work. Of course, it was limited in prison. When you are imprisoned, you become disconnected. But the support that PBI gave me while I was in prison was fundamental. It gave me contact with people of all nationalities in the world and gave me this great strength. It kept my, kept my morale high. But above all, it protected me. It was a form of political support. Of course, it was human support, but it was even more than human. It was political because the government authorities could see that I had international support. So they were going to think twice before using aggression against me. It's not that they were going to stop altogether, but... While David was in prison, there were strip searches in the yard. He refused and insisted that the guards couldn't search any of the other prisoners either. They organised a hunger strike in defence of their rights. That they won this battle, he puts down to the support he received from PBI. The presence of the brigades becomes not just a protection for the human rights defenders who are in detention, but for other prisoners. If I benefit, other people also benefit. The support is for the whole community. We have survived. It's been a tragic history. I've had it very hard, but we are still strong. We have overcome all these difficulties with our heads held high, with dignity, and above all, because of the credibility we have with the people. As the song says, we are still singing. We are still resisting. These are the words of Silvia Villasenor. Here in Mexico, there's been a policy for years of destroying the indigenous peoples, the great cultural riches that we have, homogenizing everything to have more control. Mining and hydroelectric companies sanctioned by the Mexican government are appropriating indigenous lands and threatening the lives of the communities. In 2011, the Mexican constitution was modified to extend collective indigenous rights. This led to some attempts at consultation. But so far in Mexico, there has not been a single consultation with indigenous communities which meets the criteria set out in the ILO Convention 169 on Indigenous Rights. The indigenous communities with their millennial wisdom know what is important in life and for humans. And I believe that if we lose this knowledge, 
we are lost as a society. Sylvia Villasenor works for the Mexican Institute of Community Development. She is involved in defending indigenous land rights in Puebla. Because of their indigenous roots, these communities are strongly organized. They have tried all possible ways to defend their territories. They say, where will we go if they move us from these lands? Because if these extractive projects go ahead, this would lead to vast displacement and tremendous environmental devastation in the Sierra Norte of Puebla. In the case of the Walmart hydroelectric project in Puebla, a consultation coordinated by the Energy Ministry did not meet the standards required by law. But this consultation has been recognized by the government as if it had been adequately completed in order to allow the projects to advance. The corporations are interested in these projects because of their economic benefits. In the north of Mexico, there are many projects with environmental impact. But here in the mountains, none of the planned projects have been built. They are here, but they have not been implemented. That's the goal, to prevent the displacement of communities so that the culture is not lost. When you have a link to the land and to the water, it hurts you that they want to destroy it. Here in Mexico, we all have indigenous roots, whatever the color of our skin. I lived several years in an indigenous community and you learn the values and the riches of the original cultures. There is no other way to live in this world than loving Mother Earth, respecting each other and collaborating collectively. This view of how we build our lives collectively is so important because we're not alone in the world. We're here together. I want to enjoy all the wonder of Mother Earth because I am part of her. They can't kill me. I will give up my life defending life. These are the words of Faith Kisano, a founder member of Kayole Community Justice Center in Kenya. Let me just say, I'm just here. It has been, it's like I was born into this. My adopted brother was killed during the post-election violence in 2008. Back then I was very young and then I grew up. I was born in Kayole, and then I grew up. I have friends that they also killed again through extrajudicial killings. I've lost so many friends through EJKs. I realized that lamenting in the house, getting mad and all that was not enough. We needed to join forces with the other people who were doing the same thing that I was doing and who felt that something needed to be done. I did not know anything about human rights. It was just the pain that was driving me, the pain of every day waking up and seeing us very young people. And, and the parents were like, well, you know what? There's nothing we can do. Even if we go and take this case to court, you can't bring our family back to life. And then I just felt that if we kept on normalizing, then this will never end. Faith and her group work with local people to document police brutality and extrajudicial killings. We reach out to women who've lost their sons. We just go and explain to them that if you don't come out and speak, then again, it's not your son, but your neighbor's son, your son's best friend will be the one getting shot tomorrow. You find that women in my community respond fastest when a gunshot is heard. Women open the doors even at night and come out. Men rarely do that. We find when we hear someone screaming, women come out and it's women who call out to each other. Like, open the door, open the door, someone is being beaten. Just calling out to the women in the neighboring, in the neighborhood to come out. The Kaoli Justice Center is supported in part by PBI. 
we've learned how to document from the centers that are working with PBI. We've also been beneficiaries of psychosocial support from PBI. This has helped us so much because as an upcoming center, you find that you have no resources. You've been into these injustices so much, so you're overwhelmed and the community needs your services and this is your passion. You can't just let go. We've also seen the centers you work so closely with go outside the country and go speak about extrajudicial killings out there. And we've seen the support of international organizations. Like even we saw the UN Special Rapporteur come. That's a very big achievement for us. Just making people out there know that there are extrajudicial killings and our country is doing nothing about it. Carol Mother was a human rights defender based in Dandora, Kenya, who disappeared on February the 6th this year, 2020. Her body was found on February the 12th at the city mortuary. To us, she's a social justice martyr. We believe she was murdered, and to us, she's a social justice martyr. So there's always a quote that she said before she died. She said that we are the eyes and the voice of the community. And that's what we hold dear in the social justice movement. And it reminds us, that quote reminds us of who we are. We are the eyes and the voice of the community. And we should not keep quiet when something is happening. And we should be the voice of those people who cannot voice their voice out. Yes. Right now, I'm glad because we've had some achievements. We can say we've come this far. We've documented this number of cases. We've given light and changed the narrative on EJKs. We've exposed this and this. I can say that we've done quite a lot and we brought the mothers and the survivors to talk together. Now they can actually share their stories. They can go out there and help other mothers who are coming out from that pain and who also feel that they cannot be accepted in the community because of the notion that your son was a thief, he deserved to die. So I can say we've done a lot from just being driven by anger and all that. We're now driven by love for justice, the love to see us live a dignified life, the love for our people, the love for our dignified life and to see justice prevail for everyone. Yes. Well. That was very powerful and thank you very much. Uh, well, we've heard the testimonies as it were from Kevin, Sandra, Ilo, Sylvia, David, and Faith. Uh, what I was going to do first is go to Susie Bascon and ask Susie to tell us about the multimedia project that she's been involved in. She, of course, has seen hundreds, uh, 160 uh, at least, of these human rights defenders and has heard an enormous number of stories, many more than we can cover today. I'd like to tell us, her to tell us a little bit about her experience, what was particularly striking, what was very moving, I expect much of it was depressing. Many of these testimonies we've heard are pretty haunting. And I'm sorry, I should perhaps have warned you that before you heard them, but I expect you knew that. Uh, anyhow, Susie, across to you, and tell us a little bit about this multimedia project that you're launching today. Great, thank you so much, Patrick, for your kind words before, and also to Juliet and to Christopher for such moving testimonies. I, I feel a little bit emotional at the moment, um, even when I have heard all the stories um, a few times, um, still, you know, you wrote them alive. And um, so forgive me if I'm not able to speak in the, in the same kind of way that I would uh, otherwise. Um, so as you can imagine, interviewing all these hundreds of defenders across different countries uh, over a period of two years has been, I would say, the the most um, rewarding and, and sort of um, joyful experience that I have had in my life. I know that some of these testimonies can be extremely depressing in some ways, but uh, for me personally, um, 
the element of hope is, is always underpinning uh, every uh, one of these stories. And this is, this is the main reason why I have been involved with PBI for so long, for nearly 20 some years, because those defenders, despite the challenges that they face, despite the, despite the intimidation, the threat, the, the difficult context, um, where, you know, things are not easy for them. Many times I say to Patrick and all the members of the Alliance that to be a lawyer in the UK is an easy task, but to be a lawyer in some of these countries is, is really, really challenging because the rule of law doesn't work. And it means lawyers have to be extremely creative and need to find, you know, alternative ways to not resort to violence and to violence and yet to believe, continue believing in justice and find ways to, to deliver justice to those communities. And what I have learned, what I have witnessed, what I have listened to these stories is that it is possible to deliver justice. It is, it is possible to deliver hope. It is possible to comfort and to care and continue sort of believing in, in all those victims and communities and to do it with dignity and to do it with a sense of, yes, we can do it together. Um, this is this is probably why I believe in this project because it's not just BBI, it's not just the Alliance, it's not just Juliet and Christopher. It, it's all of us together sort of being on the same platform uh, with human rights defenders, getting to know each other, sharing, you know, their emotions uh, with them and, and their emotions with us. And I think that is some, something very human and, and quite, uh, for me, very spiritual as well and, and invaluable. Um, so this project is almost a culmination, I would say, for me, of many, many years of wanting to show the face uh, of these defenders. Uh, the, the work that PBI does is very, very diplomacy-led, very much behind the scenes work. Our volunteers on the ground do protective accompaniment, shadow these defenders into very difficult situations. We do a lot of advocacy, political work. We build our networks, you know, with high profile people like the Alliance uh, lawyers and so on. But behind all that political advocacy, factual, statistical work, there are human beings, there are human stories. And, and that's always something I have wanted to document. So um, two years ago, uh, I, I had the privilege to meet uh, someone who is an artist like Juliet and Christopher. His name is uh, Manu Valcarte. He's a, a photographer, professional photographer and a filmmaker. And I was lucky to be introduced uh, to him through one of our ex field volunteers. Um, I was going to Colombia anyway. I had decided that I wanted to record the stories of these human rights defenders. And I was going there with my audio recorder because I don't really have, you know, high, high tech skills. My, my PBI colleagues know that. Um, so I, I had this, this sort of mission that, you know, Sometimes destiny um, plays a role, and, and so Manu happened to be going to Colombia at the time, and he was very keen on coming along with me, and and you know just try his best to record the stories even without you know the possibility of getting paid or anything of that kind. So we started this project, you know, by recording those stories there in, in Colombia. Then of course you know the opportunity was presented to do it in Mexico and then Honduras and then Kenya, and, and then of course the defenders who came to the UK and, and we felt, yes, let's interview them, you know, and have um, some kind of uh, understanding of their struggles. Um, and without really realizing it, we end up having all these many stories. And of course, we wanted to make sure, you know, what do we do with them? And of course, across all these stories, there were themes and, and these three themes, resilience, hope and solidarity were prominent in all the stories. And Honestly, before the pandemic hit us all, I thought, how are we going to launch this project on these three things? People are not really going to listen to us. You know, solidarity is really associated with being a hippie, you know? I mean, you are not going to be listened to carefully. Uh, and I was thinking of my lawyers, of course, as well. But the truth is that during this lockdown and this pandemic, we have all understand and understood really well what solidarity means for us, what resilience means for us, mm -hmm. and how much hope we all need in order to carry on and continue. So okay. it's almost like we are launching this project at the right time. And yes, I'll, I'll stop now uh, and, and, and leave Patrick to continue with the Q&A. Um, would anyone out there, uh, if they wish to ask a question, put it on the chat page uh, and I will do that. But one uh, to ask is this. Um, one of the things that struck me in the last two seminars, and obviously one knows it occurs, but quite how serious the problem for women is in many of these countries, and the mm -hmm. violence to women in particular. Is that something which 
was very prominent in, in the stories told to you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, throughout all the countries, uh, women tend to sort of face the, 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 the biggest sort of threat and forms of, int of intimidation because it's not, it's not only uh, often threats against themselves, but also against their families, and their kids, uh, their partners, and it becomes really, really challenging. And of course, we are talking sometimes of women that don't have access to the labor market, and therefore they do their sort of voluntary work on top of, you know, their sort of home sort of um, household duties. So, yeah, the issue of women being under attack is, is very prominent. And, and of course, the, the, the risk of being sexually abused is, is, is also very prominent. Uh, in particular, in Mexico, I was really shocked by the, the femicide. When we traveled to the north of the country, Manuel Carter and myself, I was, I was really fearful. And I, 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 I'm sure, you know, it, it, it's unfair to say that, you know, because I knew I was going to leave the country and be in a safe place. But you know, knowing that you could be killed just because you are a woman, I mean, regardless of whatever you do, especially in Ciudad Juarez, and knowing that you know, we were in a hotel which was next to a, 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 grave, a, a grave chart where, a grave chart where you know, seven women had been killed. That was quite shocking. I, I was like, and this was the daily occurrence. And there were lawyers, and there were community leaders, female community, and and they live in that context. You know, they are documenting those cases. That was quite shocking, and I've been in this field for quite some time, and yet I felt like, oh gosh, I don't know if I would be, you know, strong enough to do that job. Can I ask a, a question of Juliet? Um, I know you've been involved in human rights issues and a great supporter of PBI. How, how did you first get involved in that kind of activity? Um, I think I've always been in, uh, interested. Um, I suppose partly because our job is to imagine what it's like to live somebody else's life. It's 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 the you know it's prerequisite of our job that you have to imagine what it's like to be in somebody else's skin. So, um, you know, we, we don't have many skills as actors, but we do have maybe that one, which is just to really imagine. And I always think that political activism is usually generated by an act of the imagination. You know, and the problem with so many of our politicians and our governments is they appear to be led and run by people with no imagination as human beings to understand how it is to live in a different way, to have less, to be, or to live in any other different way from the way they live. So you get this extraordinarily narrow perception of life, which is why they're not fit for, to be, anyway, so often. So I think that, anyway, I did a, uh, what really sort of culminated that was, was in, in um, it was in about 1989 or in 1990, I did a play at the Royal Court written by Ariel Dorfman, a Chilean writer who had been in um, Salvador Allende's government in Chile, which was overthrown by, by the coup, the Pinochet's military coup, uh, supported by the Americans, of course. And he had escaped and gone to live in America. And he'd written this play years and years later about a woman who was detained um, and tortured under the Pinochet regime. She was a, you know, probably just a teacher. I mean, Pinochet's regime tortured anybody who wasn't just a supporter, basically. You could just be a teacher. You could just be an, art, an artist. You could be a musician. You could, anyway. So she was one of those. And, and the play starts 17 years later when there's been a change of government. Pinochet has been ousted finally, and there is a new democratic government. But they sought in Chile not to take revenge on Pinochet's um, collaborators and, and, torturers, his army of torturers who had destroyed a whole generation of young people. He, so they gave everybody um, sort of reconciliation, you know, they had these peace and reconciliation commissions as in South Africa, but they didn't. So for all those people who had whose lives, whose lives and bodies and minds and psyches had been destroyed by, by torture and detention or who'd lost their loved ones, did not have justice served them. And the play is an exploration of what happens one night when this woman who was systematically raped and tortured 17 years earlier, thinks she hears her torturer coming as a visitor to the house and she takes him prisoner and insists, ties him up and insists that he confess to her what he did all those years before. So it's like a great, the, the play is a wonderful exploration of those themes of how do individuals and countries and nations recover from psychological systematic abuse and, and um, and you know, what do you do when you can't give voice, when there is no voice, nowhere you can give voice to the abuses that you experience, as we've heard from these wonderful um, human rights defenders today. Um, and the, and to play, I could not play a woman who'd been 
tortured and systematically raped. And my imagination thought, I don't have the right to do that on a stage. I, I, I can't pretend to be somebody who understands that. So I went to a wonderful organization run by Helen Bamber, the great late Helen Bamber, who had started the Medical Foundation for the Care of Victims of Torture, which is now called Freedom from Torture. And it's an amazing organization that helps to repair and heal people who come to this country having been tortured, um, all kinds of therapy. And she introduced me to many people who'd been through this experience, and indeed many Ch Chilean, Chilean uh, refugees from the 70s, from that coup who were still in London, and who were incredibly generous in sharing their experiences of torture and what it was like to survive it and how it leaves you and, how, you know, and, 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 and then I got involved with her, with Helen, the amazing Helen Bamba. She became a sort of mentor for me and I helped you know just try to support her and her work in tiny ways that we can by fundraising and stuff and then that just went on and rolled and rolled really into, into other organizations and um and, re and then really I, I got very immersed in the refugee crisis in 2016 so yeah anyway but I, I find that I meet I mean I find I just meet the most extraordinary like the people that we've heard today I'm I, I meet the most extraordinary human beings just completely humble you, you know, inspire you, people with dignity and courage that I could never dream of having. Um, just amazing, amazing humanity. Um, so I, I get much more from it, you know, this connection that I'm sure I am able to put in, but it's very, very inspiring. Thank you very much. Christmas, Thank you. Um, when you uh, asked to play the part of one of the people you're giving testament to today. Uh, how, how do you set about doing that? What's your response? Is it, is it a different kind of challenge to doing other, other plays or is it uh, the same essential action? Well, I think, I think Juliet um, hit the nail on the head really with, with, her, um, with um, her allusion to um, the imagination. And that's because ultimately whenever we're playing a role as a character, we are living that experience whilst we're playing the character. And so you have to really um, believe in the moment that you are, you've, you've experienced the things that they have gone through, whatever kind of trauma usually that, that may be. Um, it's, it has an added frisson, of course, when you know that that person is not, has not been brought into existence from somebody else's imagination, but has actually lived and breathed that, that, uh, that experience that you're trying to, communicate and so for me reading just reading these stories uh, probably the same as listening to them uh, is just incredibly powerful and moving and upsetting um and uh in in some ways makes me quite uh ashamed of the my lack of activism um um in my life thus far really because it, it brings home how much there is going on and uh, around the world uh that you're not necessarily aware of but in terms of in terms of the the reading of it, it's not really an acting of it. The reading of it is just to serve the language that is on the text, to serve the words that the uh, the person with the experience is speaking, and just honour that as truthfully as possible, really, and not try and add something and try and give some performance that I want to deliver a show. It's just the words are enough because they are truth, mm. and so you just try and connect to the truth of that those words and the person that spoke them. Thank you. Uh, Susie, just one or two very briefly. Um, should the UK government put more pressure on these governments, authoritarian governments that fail human rights tests? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, an important part of the work of peace brigades is actually to engage and have dialogue with the UK government. And I have to say that well, the more pressure needs to be exercised and, and, and they always can do more, uh, we have a very good relationship with the embassies on the ground and also with the foreign office here in London. And, and they are always very open to meet and receive human rights defenders and to listen to their stories and to take advice from them and, and, and submissions, you know, so they understand better what are the issues, what are the trends in repression and how they can best represent the views of human rights defenders in international forum or, as, uh, or in, the, in the UK sort of uh, spheres. So I would say, yes, of course, we will continue putting pressure on the UK government. We will use parliament, uh, members of parliament also, uh, you know, have a role to play in, in, in ensuring that ministers through their, you know, parliamentary questions, you know, give a good response to some of the concerns that we have on the ground. But um, I also have to say that, the, the, you know, the UK government does 
engage in, in human rights work, does engage in human rights defenders uh, protection and support. And we have had a very long history of collaboration with them. And uh, only last year, they developed a best practice guide for all their embassies around the world. And they consulted, you know, EI and other peers uh, to sort of get uh, an understanding of how uh, those guides should be developed for uh, ambassadors on the ground to have a good understanding of what a human rights defender is and how best to protect them and support them. More, more heartening answer than I thought it might have been. Thank you. I think we'll have to bring <laughs> to an end, alas. Um, there are other questions which I've not been able to ask. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to thank very much the persons who have directed this. There's Rebecca McCutcheon, uh, who is a, a theatre director, and Simon Scardiland, who's a British actor and playwright, and also Theo Fox, who's been responsible for coordinating the camera throughout all of this. And of course, we must thank in particular uh, Juliet and Christopher for their terrific performance. Um, and I think it's really made the whole uh, thing come alive. So thank you to all of you who have tuned in. Um, you can carry on, I gather, on Twitter in some one way or another or on chat. Uh, and uh, Susie will continue to respond to your questions. But otherwise, I think we'll have to bring it to an end. And remember, the next webinar in this series is next Wednesday at the same time. And so thank you to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.